Hi, thank you so much, Sorona, um, for that lovely introduction. I'm, I'm really happy to be here today, and it was nice to have an opportunity to think about the ways that my work does connect to the arms trade, um, because I think it's it's one of those issues that I think a lot of people find quite abstract. And I think if you ask a lot of people how they feel about the arms trade, they would they would have like negative things to say about it. But it feels very alien and hard to really imagine how we can connect to that. So a lot of my work focuses around education. I work a lot with schools. I work a lot with youth centers. I work a lot with murals which are close to schools or education departments within galleries. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about some of my work um, to give you an idea of how artwork can be a, a gateway to help communities contextualize systemic oppression and develop a practice of challenging um, hegemony. Because Sarona said in my introduction that my work is um, about amplifying um, historical and nourishing new queer anti-colonial um, struggles. Um, but what that means is that my work often is about creating a space where people can challenge power, um, where people can think about the power, the, the systemic power that is present in their lives and how they might critically engage with it. I'm trying to speak really slowly as well for the BSL interpreter. If it's my speech sounds a bit different if you've heard me speak before. Um, yeah, so I, I wanted to start off by talking, I wanted to start off by talking about um, a resource I made for the Tate Modern um, and Tate Britain um, during my residency there in 2019. Um, so during my residency, I was working with two schools each day that I was there um, and doing workshops for young people. And one of the workshops that I developed, it was more of a warm-up exercise, actually. I would ask children to find the most boring piece of artwork in the tape. And once they'd located the most boring piece of artwork, then we would stand around it and very, very quietly and very, very sarcastically um, we would start to say, wow. And the wows would get louder and louder each time, so it starts off, wow, wow, wow. And I'm not going to scream because um, Amina, um, one of our panellists has said that they've got a problem with their ear today, so it's disrespectful to do that. But the aim is that we would get louder and louder until we were howling, screaming, um, wow. And everyone would be like, why are those children making so much noise? Um, and now that resource is available at the Tate. You can, you, you, um, at the desk, you can ask for a resource called HS for Howling. It's a yellow piece of paper, and it says you've got permission to make noise. Um, but the reason why I talk about that piece is because, um, for me, it's important to give children an introduction to protest, um, an introduction to claiming space, and an introduction to challenging institutional power because the Tate Modern and the Tate Britain, specifically the Tate uh, Britain, is an intensely colonial space and especially for black and brown children um, going into that space, there's very little representation of black and brown people apart from, you know, images of, um, of slaves dancing um, in some of the historical works, which paint a really warped picture of Messing up. No? Nope. My internet's okay? Cool. Back. Okay, sorry. Well, what, what I was saying is that the, yeah, the Tate is a, is a racist institution in a lot of ways. Um, the history of the gallery and also the way it's curated um, have a long way to go. Um, and I mentioned that piece because it's just a kind of fun exercise that I do through my artwork to try and encourage people to start thinking from a young age about how we can challenge systemic power. Another workshop that I do is the Reverse Berlin Conference, um, where I have a giant map of Europe, which is um, on laminated paper, so um, thick laminated paper, so it can be used again and again. And it's a map of Europe split onto um, 24 different sheets of paper, 
the group have to, whether they're children or adults, they have to put together the map collectively, and then they have to redesign, specifically focusing around England, redesign Europe. And what I ask people to, I give people the history of the Berlin Conference. So in 18, in 1895 uh, or 1893, I should know this off the top of my head, I normally do, but I guess we've been in lockdown a while, um, there was a conference in Berlin where European countries came together and decided on how they would carve up the, um, the continent of Africa um, and who would colonize which part. And I use this as an example of how historically people have used mapping. Um, how people have used mapping, thank you, um, in quite a violent way. And also to introduce people to the concept of abolition, because abolition requires us to kind of clear the map in a way and to, to think what would it be like if um, we started again from scratch. So what I ask children to do is to redesign Britain and I ask them to think about institutions, schools, universities, hospitals, statues. Um, do we even need schools? Do we even need um, universities? Um, what would you have instead? And then at the end of the workshop, it's a time to look at the world that we've built and to think about how We've, we've ended up replicating some of the structures of white supremacy, colonialism, heteropatriarchy, and always militarism as well. That always comes up. Um, and a final piece of work that I wanted to talk about um, briefly is a resource that I've made um, in collaboration with an artist called Rudy Lowe, um, which is called Sweet Rebellion. And it's also available, um, if you go on my Instagram, in my bio, there's a link so you can download it. Um, it's aimed at children in year seven and eight, but it could be used by anyone really. Um, and it's about thinking, it's about looking at five key figures in the history <clears throat> of slavery's abolition. All, all five of them are black people from the Caribbean or from Africa um, who worked in different ways to end uh, cattle slave, chattel slavery. Um, and the resource gives you all these, these historical examples of these different people and invites young people um, to, first of all, to collectively decide for themselves what colonialism means by looking at the history, um, to decide for themselves what other key terms mean, um, and then to create comics um, where they look at these, these, these characters and they think, okay, so Nanny of the Maroons, she, she resisted slavery by kind of strategizing in this way by running away and then creating her own um, town in Jamaica. So, um, you know, so uh, Sam Sharp um, decided to uh, organize strikes, labor strikes and these kind of strikes. Okay, so um, Oluda Aquiano um, wrote, wrote his story and his story was the thing that was, was useful. So it was asking young people to, to, to think about these characters and then to make a comic about how they would use these strategies to address oppression in their day-to-day -day lives. So I know this panel is called um, An Artist's Responsibility to Reflect the Times, but for me, I think a really important thing that has to be considered when we're reflecting the times is the way that the, the, the past is erased again and again, and it's, it's as if we have to start from scratch each time. And I think there is so much work that's been done um, by people in, in, in all different um, forms of activism that needs to be connected to. So, yeah, I, I hope that my work will give young people a, a toolkit to, to start thinking about how to challenge systemic power and, and hopefully makes conversations about the arms trade seem a little bit less daunting and, and abstract. Um, and I think that's probably been about 10 minutes. So thanks so much.